Good evening. Once again, we're taking on basic theology with Charles Ryrie. The uh, I have the original older version of basic theology. You can see it's a little abused. Uh, if you are following along and you do have a book, you probably have the newer book. So I can't really give you page number, but I will tell you we'll be on chapter 73 tonight. This is class 7-0, so we're getting along with this. When we're done with Ecclesiology, and on Wednesday nights, again, repetitive, uh, I know, we're doing Eschatology, and we're done with Eschatology, we're done with the entire book. Now, the class on Eschatology is um, where, where Charles Ryrie goes into things to come. I believe Dwight Pentecost wrote a book on called Things to Come. So this is uh, terminology straight out of Dallas at that point, I believe. So we're going to do es uh, ecclesiology tonight to study the church. We're going to get into church leadership. Uh, we're going to look at the necessity of it, the classes of church leadership. We're going to discuss individual uh, leaders. Last class we had, we talked about government. So these are the officials in the government positions, uh, different churches, how they elect them, how they select them, so on and so forth. Uh, so we're going to try and stay and try and keep a biblical model of church leadership. But again, uh, I'm going to tell you, even amongst similar churches, church leadership does vary and quite often, uh, whatever works sometimes. And obviously, the size of the church matters how many leaders you need in various parts of leadership and so on and so forth. So let's get into it. We'll pray and we'll again go into it. I will be showing the book. As, as always, we kind of do s screenshots of the book. So Father God, we thank you again for this time in class. Uh, again, the subject of ecclesiology is important, the study of the church, the understanding of the words of the church, the leaders and workers of the church, Father, and that everyone, no matter who they are, if they go to a church and they're consistent within that church body, they're all ministers of the gospel to each other. They should be uh, bearing one of those burdens. They should be part of the membership. Everybody has a function within a church, Father. Help us to focus on that, not on the guys that run it, not the guys that uh, give the spiritual guidance to the church, but I believe it's the entire church working together in unity that, that helps the church to grow and go. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, let's just get to it tonight. We're looking at the necessity of leadership, uh, whatever person's or organization's preference concerning the classes of leadership. No one can deny that leadership was considered necessary in the New Testament churches. Recall a few facts. First of all, early in church, in the life of churches, relief funds were sent from Antioch to the elders in the churches of Judea. Again, um, how does churches run? Most of the time we need func uh, funding to keep the body going. <clears throat> so that was even seen early in the book of Acts. Secondly, Paul appointed elders almost immediately in churches founded on the first missionary church uh, journey. And I believe that was uh, here in Acts 14, 23. It says, and when they appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they believed. Thirdly, the council of Jerusalem was called, conducted, and concluded by leaders. Uh, again, the first church council... Uh, was dealing with an issue on how someone is saved. <clears throat> so the leadership made decisions and did so um, as, a, as a leadership group, um, mostly the apostles. So that, that kind of a, a meeting was well beyond any church council or synod we've had since then. Uh, fourthly, elders and deacons appear as part of the normal picture of life of various churches. Fifthly, and, and that normal picture, um, as we go through the New Testament churches, you will see elders in every church were appointed. Um, we'll discuss in a moment what the word elder even means. 
Paul seemed to consider leaders of a necessity for the proper functioning of churches. And again, in Titus 1.5, talking to a, 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 a smaller group, probably more novice. For this reason, I left you in Crete, Titus, that you may set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as, you, as I directed you. So actually from that verse, you could see Titus as an appointment of Paul's to be that pastor. He was to look amongst the leadership and appoint other elders to run, help run and, and, the, and the functioning of a church. Lastly, uh, the necessity of, under the necessity of leadership, <clears throat> leadership is one of the spiritual gifts in Romans 12, 8. It says he exhorts in his exhortation who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence. So I, I and, and many people have looked at leadership as a spiritual gift. I think it's a co-joining <clears throat> between a gift and the office the man is driven to. So I think there's a couple of things going on there. Um, so we'll, we'll get to that. And that spiritual gift is functions in a local church. And remember we discussed about spiritual gifts. It's always under the guise of a local church and functioning within that church. So I think that's important to know. If you have a spiritual gift, you're supposed to function within that local body of believers. You're not just to say I have a gift and maybe go off and start a ministry, but you're supposed to minister to those within the local body of believers. And that's why I think it's so important that all members of a church, whether you're considered a quote-unquote member or you're just consistently going, they should all be involved in the functioning of the local body. What are the classes of leadership? All agree that there existed at least two classes of leaders in the New Testament churches. Elders and deacons, and I know most of you are familiar with both those terms. <clears throat> those that are in more uh, ecclesiastical type churches, high church kind of things, will know of other offices that are appointed, but uh, biblically you can't find some of those, uh, such as cardinals and popes and so on and so forth. Really can't see that in the text anywhere. So, <clears throat> Not all agree with that both are necessary today. In other words, some churches may just have a deacon board. Some churches have elders. Some have both, elders and deacons. It has been argued, for example, that since Paul mentioned only elders in Titus and, and elders and deacons in 1 Timothy, deacons are optional in the organization of the church. Neither do all agree that the matter of single versus several elders in each congregation in other words, is there a plurality of elders, plurality of deacons, or is there just one elder and multiple deacons? Um, I think that just, again, from church to church, this will vary. Uh, again, Ryrie recalls uh, what he taught in the governmental system before, what the governments are. In the Baptist congregational system, the single pastor of the church fills the office of elder, whereas the Presbyterian federal system, the pastor serves as one of several elders. And again, whatever model kind of works for your church, and I believe that also has to do with size and functioning of the church. There's different things that are going on there. So again, a lot of variables are put into that. And what we need to focus on more than anything in this class is being familiar with terminology. A more basic question is whether or not there exists a third class of leaders, bishops. The word is used once in 1 Peter 2.25. He says, For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to your shepherd and guardian of your soul. The word there, the idea there is uh, uh, guardian. Uh, the shepherd is poimain. The uh, guardian is bis biscopos. So, Otherwise, it refers to human leaders in the church. The bishops and elders refer to the same group seems clear from the following reasons. So when you talk about bishops and elders, are they talking about the same thing? Paul commissioned Titus to appoint elders in every city in Crete and then describe them as bishops. So if you notice, we already read verse 5, but he says, namely, that above reproach, the husband of one wife having children who believe not accused of dissipation or rebellion, verse 7. For the overseer, that's the word there, the overseer must be above reproach, God's steward. So 
when the translators decided to translate the word for bishop, they called it an overseer. And I kind of like that word better. Um, that's what pastors, that's what elders do in a church. They oversee the flock of God. When Paul called the elders of the church at Ephesus to meet at Miletus, he, he described their position as overseers, bishops. He also recognized that one of their functions was to shepherd or pastor the people. And again, oversee, shepherd, oversee, giving, given oversight. And I think that's important for us to see as we go through this class what actually when the rubber when the ro uh, rubber hits the road what are they doing in their office not what are they supposed to be like and i think that's the, again um it's important to see how they function when thirdly uh when paul were here when paul listed qualification of bishops and deacons he did not mention elders though we know from 517 the church had elders so Timothy at Ephesus had elders, strongly suggesting that bishops and elders refer to the same group. In Philippians 1.1, it says, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including, there's your word again, overseers and deacons. So instead of saying elders and deacons, he's saying basically bishops and deacons. Why would he admit elders if there are in fact three classes of leaders so Ryrie's basic argument is uh, bishops and elders seem to be inter uh, interchangeable terms because why would he tell in first Timothy here's the requirements of elders and deacons and they get to Philippi and only talk to the Philippian believers there about bishops and deacons that's his argument some claim that bishops are a distinct third class of leaders because James' prominence over the Jerusalem Council <clears throat> in Acts chapter 15, and because they say that Timothy and Titus served as bishops over the church in Ephesus and Crete, respectively. However, Ignatius in, in uh, first century was the first to distinguish bishops from elders and deacons as three separate classes of officials. In other words, he did it, but there's no biblical support really for it. The necessity of bishops was related to the need to preserve the unity of the church, to the need to guarantee continu uh, continuance, continuance, excuse me, in the true apostolic faith, and later the need, uh, to the need to have human channel to minister divine grace. To sum up, the evidence po points to only two classes of officials in the church, bishops, elders, and overseeing elders, or, or overseeing elders, so I, I would say elders oversee. <laughs> I don't, that's what they're to do. That's part of their function as an elder. And deacons, and deacons are to serve. So we have the two. One gives oversight, one gives service. And I kind of kind of tend to lean toward that understanding. It's so much uh, easier to see that why, within the scope of the Bible, when it uses those two offices, what they do. Distinction between gifts and offices. Confusion often exists between gifts God bestowed in a Christian's life and offices he may hold in the organization of the church. For example, pastor and pastorate, pastorate are often equated rather than distinguished as they should be. Pastor is a spiritual gift, whereas pastorate in their contemporary ecclesiology is an office occupied by the principal leader of the church particularly in the congregational system. Notice some important distinctions, however, between spiritual gifts and offices. And I think this is where we need to see the distinction, and it's important. There's really three basic distinctions. Gift versus office. A person may have a spiritual gift, but not occupy an office in a local church. In fact, this is the case with the majority of believers. For instance, what I believe is that all believers have a spiritual gift uh, what he says here, they have gifts for all believers do and are not officials in the church. So can you imagine everybody being an official in a church? That would be chaos. However, those who do hold offices should exercise, also exercise certain spiritual gifts. Elders teach and rule. Deacons should exercise the gift of service. And obviously there's other gifts involved in both of these roles. Thus, the gifted person may not occupy an office, but an officer 
must be a gifted person. So again, if I was given a test on this, I'd say what's the biggest difference is all are gifted, all are given spiritual gifts, and an officer in the church must be a gifted person using that gift within the a local body. Secondly, men and women. Gifts are given to both men and women, but principal officers in the church are to be filled by men. The only gift not given to a woman was the gift of apostleship. Uh, but God gave the others to both men and women. Even the gift of pastor can be exercised by a woman. If one understands correctly, the gift is ability to shepherd. Um, this is not to be say that a woman may occupy what is today called the pastorate. The principal offices in the New Testament churches were held by men. And I think due to the confusion today over those two terms, women should not be pastors because what usually happens is they uh, occupy the pulpit and the leadership over men, and I just find that problematic. Um, it goes on, the principal offices in the New Testament churches were held by men. This is perfectly clear. Both elders and deacons are expected to be husbands of one wife, or we could say it even better, one wo one woman type of men. Uh, you can't say that about the pastor who's a woman, unless you really go off the deep end, and I'm not chasing that rabbit today. No woman could meet this qualification. Um, and I and I want to be clear about that qualification, because if that is a qualification, it's a must. And here's what happens with some people. They look at those qualifications and they say, that's a must. Then we could never have single men filling that role or men that were widowed, um, so on and so forth. That's just problematic to look at. But I will say again, what we're looking at is men are the leaders of the church. Um, and we'll get to the idea of what a deaconess is when we get to that office as we uh, address that. Thirdly, and the distinction between gift and office, in and out of church, spiritual gifts may be exercised in and out of the local church. Where is a spiritual gift to function? Anywhere that person goes. Um, but if I'm an elder in a church, I'm not going to the grocery store and pushing that on the clerk. So when we look at this, the offices relate only to the local church. The gift of evangelism, for example, can and should be exercised in and out of church. Uh, deacons and el elders and deacons, on the other hand, function with respect to the local the local assembly. So what's an elder? What's an elder? Uh, and how many elders does one have in a church? And what, what is the interaction between offices? So we'll look at that as we look at, first of all, uh, there's three parts to this. What it does with elders, act uh, four parts we're going to look at, excuse me, their number, their ministry, their qualifications, and how elders are chosen, their selection. How do we how do we pick elders in a church? And again, these things between, again, different denominations, different church entities, all these things have a, a, um, a variance, I guess you could say, a, a different paradigm within churches. And I think when you go to a different church, and you're really in church government should be important. Uh, find out how that church functions and just see if it's a biblical model. If I went to a church and they told me my pastor is bishop so-and-so or apostle so-and-so, I'm I'm hitting the door. I'm out of there. So, uh, but there are certain things that I guess we can say is a concession for the small and and sometimes bigger churches that have out there. Uh, there are some churches, they may have a multiplicity of leaders and directors and elders and whatever, so on and so forth. You may not even know most of the people that even go there or the, or the people in charge. So if you want to be really involved in the function of the church, you've got to see who who's the go-to guy, who's your representative, or how you get involved, those kind of things. So let's kind of go through and dig through this in the second half of this class then we're going I, I would <clears throat> I would like to get through at least the office of elder cover in the next class deacon and deaconess and then ordinances in the church 
So that's our goal. Their number. Considerable debate exists over the question of number of elders each church had in New Testament times or should have today, even though we're kind of in New Testament times. Those who hold to elder rule, the federal system, believe that each congregation had several elders, while Congregationalists see only one a single elder, the pastor, in each congregation. Both agree that the ch each church should have more than one deacon. The fact of the early church met in homes makes it more difficult to settle this debate. Clearly, the church in each city, that is the sum total of house churches in each city, had elders. And we've seen these verses already. <clears throat> I don't want, for redundancy's sake, I, I don't want to go over all these verses. Clearly, the church in each city, that is, the, um, excuse me, I already read that. In other words, each house church might have a single elder who, together with other elders in other churches, constituted elders of the church in that city. Furthermore, the letters from the risen Lord to the church in Asia Minor were sent to the angel of each church. If this refers to, the, to an angelic creature, then it has no relevance to the question. But if the angel, angel designates the human leader of each church, then obviously there was only one, which reinforces the view that each church did not have several elders. Another intriguing argument is for a single elder in each congregation found in 1 Timothy 3. When Paul described the qualifications for the bishop, elder, he did so consistently with singular. But when he listed the qualification for deacons, he switched to the plural. Does this indicate that there's one elder and several deacons in each church? Or perhaps each church had a list at least one elder and, and often more than one. The one was a ruling elder, one uh, who, because of his place and prominence, was the elder of the church, even though the church may have had other elders as well. Some would have, uh, some would not give <coughs> considerations to this idea, lest it would seem to support this concept of a single bishop ruling over elders. However, the very fact that that is exactly what developed in later centuries may mean that there was a ruling elder in each assembly in the first century. And obviously at some point, uh, whether you have multiplicity of elders or you have single elder, somebody's going to start making the decisions for the body. And I believe there should be an agreement. Uh, however, it uh, runs out and, and deals with. Uh, um, so, you, you know, as you again look at these variations, um, no matter what, my concern is what are they doing? How are they running it? What decisions are they making? And there should be a unity in decision. And when there's a con, uh, the, a descending vote, someone's not not for it, or whatever it might be. Um, I think it's important that we kind of talk it out, discuss it. Uh, today's decisions, I believe, within a church are kind of different. And, and we're going to discuss this as we get into what their ministry is. So if an elder or bishop refer to the same person in the principal ministry of elders consists of overseeing the work of the church in all its aspects. Elders are not responsible only for the spiritual welfare of the church while deacons care for the financial matters is some, sometimes thought. Elders have oversight over all facets of work. Notice the uh, that the famine offering in the early church was sent to the elders in Jerusalem for distribution. This basic organization chart of for a church is not like this. So what most churches deal with today, I would say, is this idea here. Um, some churches say, well, we'll deal with the spiritual side as elders and the deacons deal with the financial side as deacons. Um, sometimes the financial side, like making the deposit, we're making out checks, doesn't even have to be a deacon thing. But I, I believe it needs to be oversight of both elders and deacons if you have those two groups. I don't see why everybody can't be involved in making sure. But what what Ryrie looks at is the model that's important to keep is this model. Um, why the elders are, should be in, in charge of all aspects of the church. And deacons is whatever is delegated to them by the elders. Um 
again, I, I, my my concern is unity in whoever's leading a church, and that's important as we look at this and see that. So let's get let's get a little bit more down into general oversight involves ruling. This means presiding and leading. Not as a lord or dictator, but nevertheless the control of authority. In First Peter five three says, "Not yet as lording over those who are allotted your charge." In Hebrews thirteen, it says, "Submit to your leaders, and and submit, uh, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls, as those who will give an account." So again, there's a watchfulness and an accountability, and I think both of those are important. A presiding officer, for example, does not even half a vote ex except in the case of a tie but he has control over the agenda so in our church at southwood if we have a board me a deacon meeting i kind of prayerfully on on a lot of subjects i steer them as the elder of the church but i don't have a board a board vote unless it's something important and i and i've never yet had an incident where the board is unanimously against something and I'm the only one for it, or vice versa. Um, we we have not seen that yet. Uh, so again, continuity, unity, all those are, are important in a government of a church. Desirable, desirably, this aspect of an elder's ministry would involve the spiritual gift of government. Used, uh, and again, used here is a basic idea of steering. I like that. Thus, an elder leads, guides, rules, steers his flock, piloting it skillfully through the treacherous waters of the world. Again, the most important thing involved in oversight, whether elders, deacons, pastor, whatever you want to say, is the spiritual health of the, of the body of local expression of the body of Christ. And I think that's a really good way to put it. General oversight also includes guarding the truth, and these are the pillars and support of the truth, the the apostles, the prophets, and the and how we present and uphold the truth. Uh, this means that both. Well, let's read Titus one nine. He says, "Holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, that he may be able to both to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict." So, again, as Elder of Southwood and leading pastor, I want to make sure the truth is upheld. And if those who contradict it, again, I'm going to say something. Those that are coming into the body of Christ, the local expression, make sure they see the door if they contradict truth. And that's that's where I want to make sure we uphold these things and see those things that we're upholding truth. Their qualifications. First of all, they are in relation to personal character. These are character qualifications. So I just want to run through these and not belabor them. Um, some of them are self-explanatory. They all, uh, and I'll take a few extra minutes because it is a longer double paragraph on B. Um, so let's kind of go through them. First of all, elder must be blameless. That is, of such character, there's no accusation that could be brought against him. And, and I think that's good. That's the overall umbrella. Does the leader of the church, the elder, does he have a blameless life? Um, or can someone come and make a gax? Now, an accusation of something that happened 50 years ago is ridiculous. What it's talking about is blameless as he stands today. And he's been, not just today, but in his time frame that he's being put up for being an elder in the church. Obviously, if you have... If you need to select the pastor and he's going to be your only elder, we can do background checks. You can talk to his, um, hopefully and prayerfully, he's given you enough references. I would examine those references. I would examine his background and maybe even have a time of um, make him an interim for a while. Watch him for a while. Don't automatically say, hey, he's our pastor. He's the guy we want. I've known people that have taken pastors from another church they've brought him in he'd become their pastor after leaving another church and finding out the guy has a lot of problems and they've made him the leader of their church without doing any uh time evaluation on this gentleman and that that itself can be problematic secondly i want to spend some time here he must be the husband of one wife does this mean and and again our translations 
have some issues with them. Does this mean he must be married? Uh, those who say no point out that if Paul meant that an elder must be married, he would have written husband of a wife. On the other hand, those who believe that an elder must be married observe that an elder must always is always described not only having as a wife but also children. Furthermore, further, all the qualifications are headed to, uh, are are all these qualifications are headed by the word must. What about Paul? Several observations in order. He is never said to be an elder. He is clearly unmarried either married, never married, or a widower when he wrote 1 Corinthians 7, where he says, I wish everyone was like I am, which is not married. And it is difficult to prove that he is married on the ground, grounds that he is a member of the Sanhedrin. Um, it is difficult to prove he was married on the grounds that he was a member. Well, the reason it is because... Um, Many people have said if you're in a Sanhedrin or a Pharisee, you've got to be married. Um, uh, I'm not going to read that. Um, we're going to skip by that. Does not necessarily inc include membership. It it is it is uncertain if marriage is a requirement for membership before 70 A.D. in in the Sanhedrin. Um, does this mean an, an elder cannot be married after divorce? Some argue that if a divorce is justified, then remarriage is permitted. And thus a divorce and remarried elder may serve. In other words, husband of one wife means one wife at a time. However, the phrase actually reserved uh, wife of a man, one man occurs in 1 Timothy 5, 9, where it precludes an en enrolled widow having a second husband. To conclude that a man remarried after divorce cannot serve as an elder does not necessarily also mean that a divorced but not remarried man cannot serve. That would involve the question of whether or not he was above reproach in what was involved in the divorce. Clearly, this can be a prohibition against bigamy or polygamy since not practiced among the Greeks and Romans. They had multiple wives in their lives but only one wife multiple women in their lives, but one wife. It is a question of whether Paul was prohibiting digamy, being married legally twice. Personally, I see the evidence as prohibiting digamy for an elder. Um, does the phrase mean that a, that a widower who remarries cannot serve as an elder? Paul did not, did permit and encourage the remarriage of widows and presumably widowers. Some conclude, nevertheless, that remarried workers, widowers, cannot serve as el of elders. This may have a matter of stricter discipline for elders as an example of others. Now, I'm going to interrupt here and tell you, I believe Ryrie later changed his tune. Um, and I'm not going to get into why he changed his tune, other than... Let's get a better understanding of this. If these are all characteristics of the man's uh, personality, that means he should be, and this is where I would draw the line, because we have, um, they never investigate this. I believe they're talking about a, a man, a one woman type of man, because whether you're married, remarried, there's men that are sketchy all over the place. Um, that's what's caused a lot of people in the pastorate to cause to, to, to do acts of infidelity because they're not one woman type of men. And I think that's more important than, I don't think Paul's bringing up the question of divorce and remarriage. I don't believe Paul's bringing up the question of widow and because it's too many variants that would cause. I believe what Paul is saying clearly and specifically, he's saying, what's the character of the guy like? Above all blameless and a one woman kind of guy. Because in life, in life, life throws you curves. What if the wife hightailed it out of town and you don't have any... Listen, I, <clears throat> I've known of a few instances where wife was, wife went loco, left her husbands for no absolutely apparent reason, and the guy was in the ministry. He took time to recover. So what do you do? Oh, well, I'm not, I can't be a pastor anymore. Well, why? What disqualified you? So, again, 
what I seen from that one phrase is open. This one phrase has caused more panic in a church than any other phrase. And they end up getting a guy that's uh, problematic. You know, being in the ministry, there's a, there's a lot of problems that can come up. He must be temperate. The original word means wineless. Um, a, 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 a basically, what's his... Can he control the things in his life? That's all it comes down to. Um, he must be a sound and sober mind. That means he's sensible. He's not a lunatic. He doesn't blow up all the time. He must be orderly. Um, it comes from the world the word cosmos. He must mean not be so involved in the world. And again, this is watching a person's lifestyle. He must be hospitable. He must be one that not only, and I don't think it always means opening up his house, but how does he host people? How does he interact with people in the church? Uh, he must be able and willing to teach. And I would put down, he also must be teachable, give and take. He must not be given to wine. Uh, and, and what does that mean? Again, what's the controlling factor in this person's life? He must not be given to physical violence. In other words, does he always want to get in a fight with somebody over something? Or does he walk away from things? He must be forbearing, not determined to have his ju just due. Um, and again, there's times that we want to say, hey, this is my way or the highway, but how is it done? And again, not to be contentious, must be free for the love of money. Doesn't free for doesn't say free for money, but if you look at some leaders today, all they talk about is money. So is that a love for money? Is that a central focus on money? The Bible talks very little about money and person's income. So how much does people today make it the central fact? Uh, and I, and I, I think, again, when he puts in here, this certainty certainly includes misusing his position for personal gain. I think that could be any of these can be misused for, personal, for some kind of gain. And lastly, he must not be self-willed. Um, in relation to family life, this the smaller intimate circle of the home serves as a proving ground for the elder's ability to guide his church. Therefore, he must still uh, govern well, rule over his family, not rule, not step on his family, but keep them in order so that his children are in a dignified subjunct and subjection. And everybody's got a different picture of this. And people pick on PK PKs, which are pre preachers' kids. They got to do this, this, and this. But does the pastor know what's going on? Does he have a handle on what's going on? Is he intimately involved with his children? Does it mean here, he says, must his children be born again? Now, that's, and what are considered children? In other words, if a guy's 29 years old and living outside the house and not married, is he still the child of that house? Uh, you know, and my answer would be definitely not. This is talking about when the house is a family and living under one roof. The qualification assumes the elder will not be married, will not only be married, but also have children of significant age to show their voluntary allegiance to the family. And also, are they listening? Are they part of church? What's going on? And um, again, this can be abused by people sitting in the pews as they over-observe and, and I'm going to say this to those in this class. Some people so watch the pastor and his kids or an elder and his kids, they forget they got to keep an eye on their own kids in their own life and put that same parameter. This parameter is just not for the elder and deacon. I believe these parameters are for anyone running a church. Now, obviously, you want to hold your pastor to a standard that's saying, I want to follow and be like him and his family, and so on and so forth. But we all put we all put a yoke of bondage on people more than they they should have. What about spiritual maturity? An elder must be not be a new convert, lest he be lifted up in a cloud bank of conceit, and that pride comes down uh, causes downfall as it did Satan's. And again, I, I believe a pastor should be in the ministry for a while, should be groomed, should be watched by the people in the church. Uh, for quite a while, and even again, there should be that period of time where he's not officially on staff until his wife is watched by that new group of believers that have brought him in. 
in relation to community life, his testimony in community must also be good. And, I, and, and in order to have a community life, a pastor's got to be involved with things outside the church. If he's just in church all the time and never being involved with anything outside the church, I think that could be a problem too. Uh, a pastor should be part of the communities at whatever level he can. Uh, there's enough community action groups, sports groups, uh, uh, different things he can be involved in, boards. Uh, I, I think a good place is if your kid goes to school, be involved in the PTA. Um, I got to serve on the boundary committee at my kid's uh, PTA for a long time, and it was kind of neat because I was involved with different things in the school board a couple of times. So and I got to speak before the school board a couple of times. So it's kind of good because here's a pastor involved with the church, with the school, which is secular, but it's, it's showing that he's out there. So that's kind of a good thing to do and be involved in their selection. Let's deal with their selection as we kind of wrap up this class. How is it, How are they to be selected and what are they to do and what is their ordination? How are, pastors, how are elders, and we're just talking specifically of the, the major spiritual leadership of the church, how are they chosen? The term elder was used in Israel and in other nations to designate leaders. The Jewish synagogue had elders who were responsible for the government of the Jewish community. The Jerusalem Council apparently took over the concept of elders from the synagogue. As new churches started, the apostles appointed elders. So the, in the new churches, apostles saw who was, was able to do that and appointed them. How they were chosen after, thereafter, Scripture does not say. It's silence. So we got to do the best we can. How, how they will be chosen today will probably be determined by the type of church government the congregation has. If it's a hierarchical, uh, hierarchical um, arrangement, they will be appointed by the federal setup. They will uh, likely be chosen by existing elders. So other elders pick other elders. And that's why I've seen... Bible churches like that, if congregational, they will be elected by the congregation. Many churches use a combination of methods, the elders nominate and the congregation vote and ratify. That's kind of how we do our deacon board. So how long should they serve? Again, the New Testament is silent on a question. Certainly an elder should not continue to serve if any reason he becomes disqualified. And I would say, again, appointments for elder and deacon are life appointments in that body as long as they're in that body that local expression of christ they should serve for the entire period should they be ordained uh the apostles laid hands on the first helpers who were chosen in Acts 6 6 they were deacons the church laid hands on paul and barnabas when they sent them out the first missionary journey but that wasn't for a leadership position other than to send them out and say grace grace be with you and and we're we're in one accord sending you out kind of idea paul warned laying hands on uh laying on hands hastily if this kind of ordination it indicated uh public recognition attestation of calling and ability and association of the congregation with the ministry of one or ones being ordained. And I like that because when you lay on hands, you're saying we're in agreement with this person. We're, we're um, again, attesting to this person can serve in that office. Um, so laying on a hand seemed to be a visible symbol of ordination. The right, that right has its roots in the Old Testament where it, where it had the ideas, first of all, but setting apart for office in Numbers 27, 23. Blessing in in when uh, Jacob was blessing his sons in Genesis forty eight, dedicating to God, uh, talking about the priesthood and transfer and participation in action. Um. So again, when we're laying on hands, we're saying you're going to represent us. You're you're going to go with us. We're in agreement with you in that position as an elder. So the last paragraph we're going to deal with tonight is ordination in the New Testament was not an appointment to an office, but a recognition of approval and support. Today, we do the same thing. Um, the way I last ordained somebody to be a pastor, we do usually do ordination for pastorate. Um, we put them through some trial period, a testing period. We examine how they teach. We, we examine their theology. Then as an agreement, as a board, we 
lay hands on them and give them a certificate that says certificate of ordination that our church says we have ordained you into the ministry. Notice, too, that a continuing relationship existed between those who ordained and the one ordained. So in 1 Timothy 5.22, I think this is important. Do not lay hands on anyone too hastily and thus share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. So they're still involved with the local body somehow, some way. This is why it should not be done hastily. If practiced today, it does not have to be restricted to pastors. Elders may be ordained, deacons also, and even missionaries, according to the New Testament example. So we're going to pick up next class with deacons. That'll, that will be uh, class 71. This was class 70. Um, prayerfully... We don't have that many more pages to go through to finish um, this section, probably about less than 20 pages, maybe two more classes, and we'll be done with Ecclesiology. And again, on Wednesday nights, running parallel with this, is Eschatology, which will things to come, and we'll finish that up. That's going to take a while because we're only going to do it one Wednesday night, and I've Got a lot of material I want to cover that's extended. That's why I didn't take Ryrie's um, book and use that. I'm using my own source materials because I think it's a... His is a little brief, and I want to be a little bit more thorough dealing with what's coming. So again, thank you for this time as, you, as we spent in ecclesiology. Uh, let's pray, and we'll close class out. Father God, we thank you for this time as we've looked at the leaders that run our local church. I'm so blessed to have that position, but Father, again, the the um, burdens you bear in that position, you've got to be uh, a man that's watched over, a man that's cared for, a man that is uh, responsible uh, to his congregation, and his congregation is responsible to him. I thank you for that interaction, and I pray for many of those that may be listening that one day will the, the desire that office, Father, that they can be groomed in such a fashion that they can be uh, the leader and the shepherd and the guardian of that local flock. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace and peace. Catch you next time here with Basic Theology with Pastor Eric. God bless.